What in the hell are you doing? What do you mean, what am I doing? I'm making a Hawaiian pizza. You told me I was in charge of dinner, so I'm taking the opportunity to make one of my favorite dishes. No, I'm not eating that. What do you mean you're not eating my pizza? Bill, you don't seem to be understanding me. Pineapple on pizza is illegal. That's blasphemy. Show me the- <laughs> Show me the law that tells me I can't. The law? How about I don't want a pizza that can't decide if it's a panini or a fruit salad? You simpleton, have you ever even tried it? No, because I don't want to. Well then how can you even say anything about it? It doesn't matter what you say, I'm not eating that thing. Ugh, I'm so over your BS, Bob. Like, come on, it's just a pizza. What, are you a wuss, Bob? Just man up and eat the damn thing. It's a pizza. I can't. Why? I'm allergic. What? Where did that come from? Somewhere. And I'm not telling you. Yeah, I think that's good. Wanna go for a swim? So I think it goes without saying that this video has the potential to ruffle a lot of feathers, regardless of how many times I say that my intentions are harmless. So I think it's a good idea for me to make a very necessary disclaimer. I'm not here to tear K-pop another butthole. In fact, I'm not even here to be negative about anyone, and as someone who has been quite critical of K-pop in the past, I know that might come as a shock to a lot of you, but if you're anything like me, and you spent the entirety of last week down a very deep rabbit hole of K-pop videos, this entire experience left you wondering, what exactly made K-pop so big in the West? You know, I think this is a very interesting topic that involves a lot of different aspects of popular culture, and I think we're capable of having a pretty mature discussion about this without me waking up tomorrow and seeing hashtag Joanna CD is over party trending number one on Twitter. And you know what? If that means I have to walk on eggshells and tread carefully through this video, bring it on! But anyways, that's enough of my rambling. All the articles I read before making this video will be linked down below in MLA format. That's right, I did learn something from English class. So if we're gonna talk about K-pop, we first need to talk about how it came to be. Now, I'm not gonna sit here and cover every single corner of Korean music history because we would be here until tomorrow. So if you're gonna be one of those people who comments- Joanna, who do you think you are forgetting to comment about that one time on the 3rd of November in 1993 when that one Korean artist painted himself blue it was pivotal? Yeah. Please don't. So our story begins in the 1990s, when the Korean music industry underwent a very big change. It was at this point that Korean music artists started to incorporate more popular American music styles into their songs, such as jazz, rock, hip-hop, electronic dance music. This spawned some of the first Korean boy bands at the time, but unfortunately their success was really only limited to Korea and they didn't really gain much traction in the West. But then, in 1995, uh, this guy, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna try to pronounce his name because I'm gonna butcher it into a cold cut of me, but this man, he was a South Korean record producer, and he'd been exposed to all the American music trends at the time, and he wanted to recreate that in South Korea. So he went back home, knocked on their door, and said, hey, we need to change things up a bit. So he did. He'd really seen the power of American pop culture at the time, which keep in mind was a whole lot of Britney Spears, Backstreet Boys and this. And all these artists really had one thing in common. It was all teen-centered pop. So our uh, South Korean record producer here established his own entertainment company and alongside other entertainment companies, went out in search of the tallest, thinnest looking dudes possible. And female dudes, you can't forget them. Sound a bit like a weird criteria? Yeah. Well, it was all to appeal to the teen masses, so. Then these K-pop recruits were groomed to appeal to the global audiences, put through a set of extensive and intensive training programs for singing, uh, dancing, etiquette, and a whole other slew of things. Now, one of the first boy bands to rise from this madness was a band named Hot. Hot debuted in 1996 with the first semblances of modern K-pop, you know, the cheerful melodies, the extremely energetic dance moves that would probably put Just Dance out of business. And then one thing led to another, tomato into tomato, one direction turned into five directions, and you had K-pop. Video's over. Okay, not really. So you're telling me for the whole 18 years that we've lived in Joanna's head, you haven't told me that you're allergic to pineapple. What? I was shy. Allergies are a really personal thing. You know I don't believe you, right, Bob? Well, you should. Okay, fine. I'm not allergic to the pineapple. 
But I am allergic to the crust, though. Oh, come on! Billy, you can't force me to eat something I don't want to. Bob, just eat the goddamn pizza. If I eat it, will you shut up about it? Sure, I guess. Here. That was the most vile thing I've ever eaten. Well, of course you'd say that. You aren't appreciating the nuances and the flavor. Nuances and the flavor? Who the hell do you think you are? Martha Stewart's son? Let me bring you back to a simpler time. The year is 2012. Justin Bieber releases Boyfriend and has the second highest first week sales of a new single ever. Snoop Dogg officially changes his name to Snoop Lion. Chris Brown releases music and still somehow manages to be relevant. And to round off the year, we get the biggest banger ever, the iCarly soundtrack. Oh, and also this happened. A South Korean artist by the name of Psy releases Gangnam Style, which goes on to be the first YouTube video to reach 1 billion views. Instantly, every grade six class was blasting this song at their graduation and doing that stupid dance. Point is, this is regarded as the turning point of the West's infatuation with K-pop, and it shows. In 2008, the K-pop industry had a total of $16.5 million in exports to the US, but by 2012, the figure was 235 million. Now, sure, you could just write off Gangnam Style's success as a one-time thing, but after this, K-pop steadily gained traction in the West and turned into the monster it is today. So what exactly made it so successful among its target audience? Wait, what? I think it's no secret that there is in fact a formula to make a hit song. I mean, there's a reason why when you turn on the radio, everybody sounds like they took too much of a swig from the Taylor Swift Kool-Aid. The approaches to tempo, harmonics, even lyrics have become increasingly similar as everybody tries to break the top 40. Now, in 2011, researchers in Europe looked at this and said, hey, we can make an experiment out of this. So they did. The study broke down hit songs into 23 different elements. Things like cadence, song length, energy, danceability were all quantified. Now with all this data, the research produced a hit potential equation. I'm gonna show you a math equation now. So if you don't wanna see that, uh, now's a good time to close your eyes. Five, four, okay, here it is. Now each W in this disgusting thing represents features like danceability, energy, like we've mentioned before. The formula also predicts the success of a song to an accuracy of 60% which kind of goes to show you how everything we consume is specifically engineered to make us want to come back for more, but you didn't hear it from me. However, the data was not only useful in showing us that we are just a bunch of sheep who will eat anything served to us on a silver platter, no, no, no. The data the scientists gathered showed that danceability has become more important to audiences over the past 50 years, and rhythm, on the other hand, has become increasingly rudimentary with simple binary rhythms becoming more popular. What is a simple binary rhythm? I don't know, I just put it into Sound Smart. So what does any of this have to do with K-pop, you may be wondering. Glad you didn't ask. So this is where things are gonna get a little bit confusing, so just bear with me while I explain. So if you spend a considerable amount of time on Twitter, you've probably already heard of BTS, which is arguably K-pop's biggest boy band at the moment. And I'm telling you this because the data I'm about to show you uses BTS as kind of a representative of K-pop as a whole. So here's what happened. Spotify's internal algorithm brain took a bunch of BTS songs and analyzed them for these musical features on the left here. And then it assigned a numerical value for each and pooped out this absolutely terrifying graph thing, monstrosity. I don't, this is the sixth time I'm filming this. Then this robot brain turned and said, hey, I don't think I've terrified people enough. So that computer brain took this data plus did the same thing for a bunch of other Western artists and compared it in this table of values. So in other words, essentially what we're doing here is finding a quantitative way to compare K-pop to Western music. So clearly there are some outliers here. 
Let's discuss. So first off, speechiness. BTS smokes absolutely everybody in this category. Like, wow, we look at that margin. They're also noticeably higher ranking in energy, which makes sense because if you've ever found yourself watching a BTS stage performance video, uh, they're doing like Cirque du Soleil on the stage. Yeah, you have to be mad to even attempt that stuff. But this is where things get interesting. Instrumentalness and acousticness, which I think using some critical thinking, you can decipher what that means. They are noticeably lower in that category. Like they've fallen off the world map. They're screaming for help. However, this is no mistake, might I add. Remember that hit potential equation I showed you? Well, scientists found that high energy dance songs that usually lack instrumentalness tend to top the charts more often. And guess what? BTS follows those trends to a T. So do with that what you will. But that's it, that's the entire picture. Now I know all the hard, real data I just showed you was pretty convincing and everything, but let's be honest here. I highly doubt that K-pop fans are going to shows with spreadsheets and tallying the number of words said and the rhythm pattern. So there has to be a more visceral, surface level reason as to why K-pop has taken over. And the reason, my dudes, is simple. It's stage presence. You know, in preparing for this video, I watched a lot of K-pop videos, like a lot. And the first thing I noticed was just how much effort these K-pop artists put into the performance aspect of their songs. They put so much energy into their performances. Their onstage dance numbers are wild. They finish drenched in sweat. It's a workout and a half. And it made me realize something. A couple weeks ago, when everyone was screaming their heads off about the AMAs, I took it upon myself to watch some of the live performances. And in my eyes, every performance was honestly a freaking headache to watch because a singer has become 1% of the equation. Now, if you don't bring your entire kitchen sink plus the circus on stage, who the hell even are you? There's gotta be balloons, fire, a choir, an entire army of background dancers, the Garden of Eden. Anyways, you get the idea. And I can't help but think that this overcompensation in set design and whatnot is just to make up for the fact that most of these artists have little to no stage presence. Now, obviously, I don't wanna say that every artist nowadays is just a broomstick on a stage, but the next time you watch an award show and Taylor Swift is singing with the entire Brazilian carnival on stage behind her, I implore you to imagine what this performance would look like minus all the bells and whistles. Would you still be entertained? And this is, at least in my opinion, where K-pop differs greatly from most Western artists. There's something more personal and entertaining when you see an artist command the stage by themselves rather than relying on the acrobatic zoo behind them to keep you entertained. You see how connected the artist is to their art and not just a candle who stands there singing easily digestible tunes. You know, we don't have to go much farther back in time to see how successful entertainers who define themselves by their onstage presence work. Again, I don't want to make a blanket statement about all artists today, but I think there's a reason why people have responded so strongly to this. <laughs> snack time and as an obedience exercise the teacher made us eat those disgusting fruit cups peaches and pineapple bathed in that nasty fruit juice that was probably more chemicals than fruit piss i screamed and yelled they had to get teachers to hold me down while they forced that crap down my throat pineapple was never the same after that wow I don't care. No, but really, Bill, how do you even manage to eat this crap? And why are you so infatuated with it? I'll tell you why. Because pineapple pizza is morally superior to every single type of pizza out there, Lemonhead. Oh, there you go again with your moral superiority, Bill. Like, honestly, how does pineapple manage to beat out good old pepperoni pizza? Pepperoni? You know that stuff knocks off like three years of your life with every bite you take. Honestly, you must have eaten enough pepperoni at this point to have a negative lifespan. I mean, I thought I'd done a good enough job of hammering it into my head, but I really don't know why I deal with you people. Now, I'm gonna go about this next topic in the most respectful way possible, because I feel like there's a very high potential for me to offend, like, the entirety of Twitter. I think it's no secret that the K-pop fan base is one of the most intensely dedicated and loyal fan bases at the moment. The very reason why I'm making this video is because I see fan accounts all the time on Twitter and I have no idea what's going on. Like I wake up every day 
get out of bed, go over to the toilet to do my morning business and check out who's been canceled for the day. Like it's just a part of my routine at this point. But I digress. Remember when believers were a thing and stood above all other fan armies on social media? For six years straight, beginning in 2011, Justin Bieber won the top social artist award at the Billboard Music Awards, which is fan voted and included the likes of Taylor Swift and Selena Gomez. Every year we had more and more Bieber and it seemed like it was never gonna end until 2017 came running in and Mr. Bieber's reign of terror ended abruptly when a seven member boy band from South Korea shook things up a bit. Four years into their musical career, BTS swept in and won the top social award with more than 300 million votes. No, no, I don't think you're hearing me. 300 million. Who are these people? Now this is all to say that the K-pop industry has a very deep understanding of the effect that digital fluency has in the streaming age. The more data savvy and proactive your fans are, the more power they have to impact the charts. So the name of the game is engagement. No, I'm not getting married. So this next information that I'm about to show you, I gathered on a little deep dive in Twitter, so let me enlighten you. BTS has three different accounts, which helps increase engagement. So the first one, BTS Views, is dedicated to tracking the number of YouTube views they get. The second one, BTS Voting Team, is all about hashtag driven voting. The third one, BTS on Billboard. Let me read you this quote that should tell you enough. It's devoted to helping BTS spread their wings and fly on the billboard charts. You part of the cult yet? Okay, good. That's not where the madness ends, however. No, no it's not. Because through some more research, I found that each of these accounts has at least seven administrators, each of which is posted in a different time zone so that they can cover all hours of the day. I mean, it's ingenious, but it's also kind of crazy. So aside from all of this really effective social media marketing on their part, there's one more thing that makes K-pop so successful. I've danced around it several times already in this video, but I have yet to hit the nail on the head, and that is the power of a teen fan base. So it's no secret that the biggest demographic that enjoys K-pop is young teenage girls. In fact, this is no new idea. Most successful artists of our time have benefited from a juvenile audience. Audience. Younger people do tend to find a sense of identity or escapism in watching their favorite band perform. There's a sense of community in <clears throat> standing. A term used to describe a fan who goes to great lengths to obsess over a celebrity. This definition comes from the most accurate and reliable resource on the English language, Urban Dictionary. There are hundreds and hundreds of communities online that form on the basis of people having the same interests. Thousands of individuals live vicariously through their idols, and this forms a very strong, albeit one-sided, bond between the viewer and the artist, which in turn causes the viewer to become increasingly devoted and protective of said artist. And you know what? We could sit here and argue about the ethics of profiting off of a young and easily manipulated fan base, but you have to admit, it's working for them. Literally, while I was making this video, BTS performed on CNN during New Year's Eve. Where am I going with this? You know, I think the greatest thing I realized while making this video was that I was horribly wrong about K-pop. I'll admit, K-pop is not my thing, but I've really come to appreciate just how not mediocre it is. You know, these artists clearly care so much about their craft, and that's something that I appreciate immensely, and what seems to be a culture that rewards those who scream the loudest, per se. I think I always had this idea that K-pop was just a weird cultural phenomenon that didn't really deserve my respect. And you know what? I'm not going to be walking down the street listening to K-pop, but what right do I have to not let people enjoy it if they want to? I read an article while doing my research for this video that said music and the public appetite for a specific sound isn't static, which makes sense. The music industry simply caters to the demand. Is this a momentary trend, or will we be learning about K-pop in history class 10, 10, 100 years down the line? Who knows? Certainly not I. Holy crap, I'm tired of this video! Okay, I guess moral of the story is just be nicer to each other on Twitter and don't be biased. Okay, bye!